This was such a cool conversation with Phil Wagner, the founder and CEO of Sparta Science. Have you heard of this company? They're doing amazing and interesting things. The Sparta Movement Health Platform can analyze broken biomechanical chains in the human body just by analyzing a foot strike. And then the app designs a workout program based on the feedback from the measurement device. Are you kidding me? How cool is that? If you're a movement, fitness, physiology, kinesiology, or biomechanics geek, you will love this fun and nerdy conversation with Phil Wagner. Hi, I'm Erin Power. And I'm Laura Rupsis. We're certified health coaches, and this is Health Coach Radio. This podcast is about the art, science, and business of health coaching. We share our insider tips to help you become a better coach and entrepreneur. And we interview expert guests to discover how they've made it in this growing field. It's time for health coaches to make an impact. It's time for Health Coach Radio. All right, Phil Wagner, how are you? Fantastic. How are you guys? We're doing great. We were just talking before we hit record how excited we are to learn from you and your years of knowledge and expertise. Can you fill our audience in a little bit on sort of who you are and how you landed here? Yeah, I, I really, you know, loved playing on a team, loved being a part of sports. Obviously, training and fitness is a big part of that. And so not being the best athlete, I really kind of gravitated towards the training side quite a bit to, you know, empower, improve myself, um, but kept getting injured Mm. Uh, and super frustrating, right? When you put all this time in and, you know, the results aren't what you want and those negative results keep happening. Um, And that really kind of got me interested in the human body and, you know, how, how injuries happen and, and what can be done to avoid or at least limit some of those things. So, went to medical school with this idea of, hey, let's approach musculoskeletal injuries. Let's approach movement, you know, from a medical aspect, you know, like, like we approach diabetes or cancer. Um, And let's use software and data and technology to start better understanding why these things happen. And so, you know, from there, that's where we kind of launched uh, our software and technology to, to start working with sports teams initially, and then the military and now expanding, you know, to more folks everywhere, not just kind of the the elite top performers. Wow. Why do you think musculoskeletal injuries and, and um, issues have, have, have up until now not been addressed like the rest of medicine? Yeah. Um, I think these, these types of injuries, like I think we touched on briefly before we started is there's an acceptance, right? There's a desensitization of, well, if you train hard, you're going to get hurt. You know, mm-hmm. if, you know, if you play a, if you play a certain way, you're going to get hurt. If you're a certain age, you're going to get hurt. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, we, we commonly see though, all these people breaking that notion. Right. I mean, my, one of my favorite stories is, is that four minute mile, right. When nobody, nobody had done it and then one person did it. And then all of a sudden there's a host of others right after. Right. Right. And it just kind of breaks our construct. And I think a lot of these times these, you know, we accept that, oh, it's a contact sport or it's, you know, you know, a certain type of exercises that causes pain, causes injury. And we accept that. And that's not always the case. Right. Yeah. It's like, just because it's normalized doesn't mean it's normal. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean. Yeah, I, I mean, I, we we were talking before we pressed record that we're kind of um, more in the fitness end of the realm rather than the maybe competitive sports end of the spectrum. But like the number of dumb injuries that I live with to this day that persist right. because of dumb stuff I did in the gym mm. in the name of fitness. I'm using air quotes for those listening. Fitness. I mean, it. it blo- I'm, I get really upset because, like, when I was 26 years old, years old, I had to walk with a cane because I had, um, I had to, I had, I had pushed through tendonitis, which you don't do. You just, you just don't push through tendonitis. That's not how tendonitis works. Anyways, and I couldn't weight bear anymore. And it's just like, wow, fitness. So, um, from the from the fitness perspective, you know, that's kind of where we maybe the space we mostly play in because we're talking to coaches. Cause I can, I think from the athletics perspective or sports perspective, there's that competitive drive that's built in. So we, people do push through, but what do you think happens in the fitness, in, in the fitness realm? I know that's a big question, but 
why do you think just regular folk like me and and us are getting so destroyed in the gym? Yeah, we we almost expect or demand that you know, in order to have those gains, there has to be some sort of price that we've got to pay. You know, to to get those gains and that in a way if we can't con- concretely feel that price, mm-hmm. we may not be thinking or making those improvements. And and I think it's a lot of this is reshaping our our perspective that what we're trying to do is is move better, right? Mm-hmm. And um, that's really the end goal, you know, because if we think about getting larger muscles or stronger joints, a lot of times that can be associated with more soreness and pain. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if we're focused on moving better, you know, sometimes that soreness will be a byproduct and that's okay. But if we try to look at this structural muscle bone as the end goal, you know, sometimes it's too coupled to that pain or soreness. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you're right. I think just the, the sort of the point to make there is that like a lot of healthy behavior change, it doesn't have immediate obvious outcomes and it's not sexy if it doesn't suck. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, there's a lot of parallels there to body weight, right? It doesn't, you know, if you're looking to lose weight, it doesn't happen right away. Right. And it's, and it's much more of a linear process, but I think we always want that, that quick validation, right? Mm-hmm. That immediate validation. Yep. And that's what that soreness provides some sort of validation yes. that you did well, you know, it's that's so funny. Right. So um, I'm going to poke fun at CrossFit a little bit. Cause I love it. And I, I coach CrossFit and I owned a CrossFit gym for another yep. of years, but because I was inside it and I owned it, I feel that it's okay for me to poke fun at it and kind of, are you going to name, are you going to name, drop, name drop uncle Rabdo right now? No, just. <laughs> Not, well, that's a whole other issue. Holy cow. But um, I'm just in general, the mindset around CrossFit. I was talking to a fellow coach the other day who was saying, um, you know, when they onboard clients that they send the message that if they're if they can't make it there four to five days a week, why bother? OK, that you're not going to get the results you need if you're only there for three days a week. And I'm like. Perhaps if they're still eating fried chicken and mainlining beer with an IV and, you yeah, know, right. I, I think three days a week with, with other proper movement, right? Attending CrossFit three days a week, but then walking more, um, uh, hiking, playing with your kids, all of that stuff, as long as you're moving every day. But I don't think you need that super high intensity. I mean, I literally am coaching classes and people are limping as they're walking in because they're so sore. From the workout they did yesterday. Yeah. And I think that's another normalization that's that's occurred, right? Is you get locked into this four day, five day, you know, one hour, whatever constructs in your head of how much time is required, you know, mm-hmm. for fitness. And one of the exciting things that's coming out in research, and researchers actually name this sprint snacks. Oh. You know, which for a researcher to call it sprint snacks, like yeah. You know, that's that's a pretty good marketing term, but it what the idea is is that you know you can do bouts of four minutes, 30 second snacks, if you will, throughout the day. Yep. And it's as if not more effective, you know, than an hour-long workout, right? Mm-hmm. Because what really matters most is the frequency, not the duration, right? And I think that can really open up a lot of opportunities for people to get healthier or fitter when you start reducing the barrier to entry. Yeah. Because if you think, hey, I've got to come in to your point four or five days a week, you know, for a half hour, hour, and I got to drive there, you know, that that really starts to challenge, you know, your life as opposed to, hey, if I just do 30 seconds as hard as I can, you know, three times a day, like that is yeah, you know, that that's game changing for a lot of people's schedules. Oh man. My brain cannot comprehend that no matter how many times I hear right. it. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, we need some influencer. I can't <laughs> believe I just said that, but we need like an influencer with big muscles, all yeah. that muscles who says, Hey, I work out uh, six times a day for 30 seconds. And this is, you know, I just, for some reason, even though I hear it and hear it, it's like, no, it's going to have to be 45 minutes of weight training. That's how it well, works. It's, it's the same. I think in my mind, it's the same way as soreness, right? There's got to be some sort of price. And so people say, okay, I've got to be sore and I've got to give up a big chunk of my life in order to get fit. 
right? And both of those are, you know, concrete sacrifices, but they're both not true. Yeah, right. I love that. You know? okay. well, this, this, like we had a conversation with John Drakebush, remember doctor, he, he developed the X3 bar where he's talking about, he works out, what does he say? Like four days a week for 10 minutes, you know, he's working, it's, it's one set at high intensity of a set of movements. And he's, he's talk about jacked, right? I mean, this guy's got muscle and this is what he's talking about. He's not doing the micro workouts thing, but it's a similar concept. And, and I guess, you know, I'm, I try to in the classes that that I'm teaching because it's no longer my gym anymore. But what I'm what I'm trying to impress to the people that are attending these classes is having a conversation about what they're looking. What do you need to get out of this workout today? Mm. And th- just just because you you know they use a, a concept called level method, which I love, which helps people identify from the standpoint of preparedness and physical fitness and conditioning. You know h- how can I structure this workout to fit where I am? And I love that. Uh, but sometimes people might be blue level normally, but I'm so sore from three days of CrossFit, you know, maybe I need to move down a little bit and that's okay. Cause what I want to get out of this workout is just that I made it here and I'm around my friends and I participated with everybody. And who cares if I crushed it today, if your body's right. telling you, mm, you know, and, and what I love about the community that I'm in is, is the coaches are okay with that. It's not this, like we're yelling at you just push harder um, you know, you, everybody can, can take that, but I, I'm just speaking, generally speaking, I'm just using that as a metaphor for the fitness CrossFit, generally speaking, how much of this recommendation is just driven by the fact that they want to get paid, that the more often people are coming right. in, right, right. The more money they make. It's, um, a, it's a big pharma analogy, right? Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's supporting, there's always a, a financial kind of bent behind a lot of these recommendations, right? I mean, mm-hmm. when creatine first came out, it was like, well, you got to do a loading, right, mm-hmm. over seven days, right? And then they realized after a few years, well, actually, the loading makes you go through the can of creatine faster, which uh-huh. then you got to buy another can, right? But you don't really need to do the loading phase, yeah. right? So it's, you know, I think there's a lot of that within the fitness industry, you know, and yeah, I think it's a lot of these injuries and pains come up from from overdoing things you know, have a desire to get better, but the reality is you, you don't really need to do as much volume as you think. Right. Right. I think the, um, the, the moving better arm of fitness, like these movement specialists, I, I see a guy who's a movement specialist and, um, like we touched on earlier, it's just, it's just not as sexy. The things he has me do are like right. balancing, balancing on a squishy piece of foam. And it's like, <laughs> what is this going to do? <laughs> Never mind. It completely cured my stupid glute amnesia, but anyway, right. <laughs> it must be maddening in some ways to be in that branch of fitness. And I'm wondering, so you mentioned like you developed the software and originally it was for sort of team, like teams, like high-performing teams and then the military. And now it's kind of being rolled out from what I understand, if I interpreted correctly, more to gen pop, Correct. but like, who are you finding from the general population? So like maybe the people who health coaches and fitness coaches would work with, who are these people? Like what is bringing them to you? Are they excited about improving their movement or is it a, do you get the sense that it's like, well, I guess I have to do this. Like, I'm just kind of want to get a sense, like a pulse check on this part of the industry. Yeah. I think the biggest opportunity where technology can be helpful is to identify what you don't need to do. And so it's really in line with what our conversation is in that, you know, how do we reduce, I think people want to get fitter, get stronger but they want to do it in a faster trajectory, right? Yeah. And so how I think where technology plays a role for everybody is it can it can identify what you as an individual need quickly. And that, in a sense, reduces the time and a lot of time reduces the stress because you're not strengthening areas that are already, you know, suffice or you're not spending more time, you know, in areas you don't need. And that gives you I mean, we like to say the best gift of technology in fitness or in performance is you can give someone time. Yeah. Time to, okay. time to go on walks, yeah. time to spend with your family, time to eat better, right? Time to sleep more, right? All these other aspects. That's that's ultimately what shorter workouts or technology should do. Okay, cool. So if I'm if I'm hearing this correctly, then it's sort of like this technology, and I think we should get into at some point how it works. Um, but it sounds to me like it maybe reduces the time spent for lack of a better term, hunting and pecking to try to figure out where maybe the balances or the biomechanical breakdowns are. It helps you kind of zero in a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah Cause I think a lot of times in fitness, right. And performance, 
we read something, we see something, and that's the answer, right? Yes. You know, because <laughs> like my sciatica. Answer, right. <laughs> like someone, but ultimately, what you have to do is hunt and peck to yeah. find someone that, you know, just by chance has the right solution. Yeah. Yeah. We call, was, it, we call was, it church hopping. You know, it's like you're that? always church hopping. You're always looking for like the right church, right? And um, yeah, ultimately, like, you know, you've got to find that spirituality or in this case, the right movements for yourself. Yeah, yeah. And I just to like, I shouted about sciatica because just to close the loop on my glued amnesia story, if anybody cares, I thought it was sciatica and I was going, I was chasing sciatica pain relief. And this movement expert guy was like, I don't think that's what it is. Like, I think it's that your, your brain has forgotten that your left glute exists and we need to make that connection again. And that sounded so crazy, but like, literally I'm not kidding you standing on this squishy piece of foam at my desk, fixed it anyway. But like how much, how much, how often did I spin my wheels? How much of my health savings account did I spend <laughs> chasing sciatica? Cause I self-diagnosed it. Mm -hmm. um, so to, to your point, it's like, there's a lot of, I mean, that's time that w was wasted. And even when I went to this guy and said, great, we fixed it. When can I start squatting heavy again? He's like, right. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. well, I think, you know, the idea is right. You should be able to do those things you enjoy if it's squatting heavy, but how can you make time to still do those things to allow yourself to do it? Right. That's mm -hmm. where the, the balance has to occur, you know, yeah. but yeah, oftentimes we wait for something bad to happen then we fix it and then we're off it. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So can you, so first of all, you know, those of us that have been gym rats and in the fitness realm and, or just understand movement, understand what musculoskeletal means, but some of our health coaches that listen really aren't in this realm. Could you define that for us? And then, um, if you wouldn't mind, I would I'd like to lead into kind of the technology that you've developed and, and and who's it for? Is it for the coach to use with clients? Is it direct to consumer? But first, if you don't mind, like very, again, because like I said, we get a lot of health coaches that really, they're not fitness people, but they have an interest here because they got clients complaining about neck pain or low back pain or or a weak wonky knee or whatever it is. You know, it, you know, there's different systems in the body, right? You've got your digestive system, right? Mm -hmm. Intestines, you've got your cardiovascular system, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and then you've got your your musculoskeletal system, right? Which is the series of of structures, your muscles, and then your ligaments, right? Mm -hmm. Which attach bone to bone, and you've got mm -hmm. tendons, which attach your muscle to bones, right? And all these structures make up the musculoskeletal system, right? And it and it really works as that you know framework of integrity that that keeps um, the body in a state where it's able to move and respond to movement. And then there's other pieces to that system like fascia, yeah. which folks are familiar with, with foam rollers. And that, that serves as like, if you will, a saran wrap around all these structures to keep them connected. Right. And so all these structures, the beauty about them is they're very plastic. They can respond to different stimuli, um, good and bad. Right. So there has to be some stress for them to improve. But too much stress causes damage. But the good news is, you know, as, as Aaron was talking about with her issues, like it it can respond and improve. So if there's an injury, it doesn't mean, well, you're stuck. You know, good luck the rest of your life. You're going to have that. You know, it can respond and, and improve based on different stimuli you give. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's an exciting time to be a health coach. Scientists are uncovering the mysteries of the human microbiome. We're now gaining clarity into complex gut health issues we didn't even know about a decade ago. This means it's also a great time to become a gut health expert. Primal Health Coach Institute's Human Intestinal Microbiome in Health and Disease Specialist Certification is for health coaches who want to help people heal the root problems of many of their health symptoms and conditions. A recent survey spanning 73,000 people across 33 countries found that nearly 40% of adults suffer from a gastrointestinal disorder. As an expert in gut health, you can offer unique programs and services to clients looking to manage or reverse a diagnosis such as an autoimmune disease, irritable bowel syndrome, or type 2 diabetes, or those who wish to improve their overall health. Gut health expert, cardiologist, and best-selling author Dr. William Davis teaches you everything you need to know about the human microbiome, 
including coaching tips to give you the confidence and credibility to support your clients and help them heal their guts, sleep better, gain more energy, and enjoy stronger immunity, balanced mood, smoother skin, and more. Find out more about how to become a gut health expert. Visit PrimalHealthCoach.com. So to Erin's story, she thought it was one problem when it turned out to be something else. I, I had an issue back when my twins were first born and I was lugging around that stinking baby carrier everywhere. Yep. And I, I went to get back into the gym and I couldn't do a pull. I could not hang from the bar because my shoulder hurt so bad. So I went in to get my shoulder looked at and the guy's like, it's not your shoulder, it's your bicep. I had a bicep yeah. tendon problem, you know? So all of these little pieces all interplay together. So the pain might be in one place, but really the culprit is somewhere else. So that this is where the dot, dot, dot technology can help you be like, well, stop worrying about icing the sh- shoulder. The problem is actually the bicep. Um, and yeah. this is where we can focus in it. So would you mind kind of taking us through what prompted you in terms of building out this technology, how you built it and, and how the everyday Joe can access it and use it and what it does. Yeah. So I think, you know, in, when I was going through medical school, I heard a great term, which kind of relates to what you guys are talking about where it hurts. It ain't exactly, you know? And so really the body is a system, right? Mm -hmm. And so often where we feel something Mm -hmm. is not necessarily the cause or where we may be hurting, you know, to do a movement or underperforming. There may be something further down or further up the chain that's causing that dysfunction or causing that pain, right? So this idea we we were thinking about is like, okay, what's what's the common thread behind a lot of these movements um, and pain and dysfunction? What we what we came to was it's the ground. Hmm. How do you interact with the ground dictates a whole host of other issues, um, because if you if you slip and fall, if you jump a certain way, you know, and all these have to do with how you interact with the ground. Um, when we first started, we started working in baseball and we were able to find and understand risks behind elbow injuries. We could decipher from a jump. Wow. And that was like, just like mind blowing to us and validating of like, oh, I guess that makes sense because if you don't throw a baseball with your legs, you have to rely on the smaller muscles of your upper body, which therefore stress your elbow, right? And so it's the same idea in most of these movements. How can we look at the system and particularly a ground interaction to see how that flow of energy is happening? Because back to your example, Laura, around, you know, carrying around, you know, baby uh, carriage there, you know, it could also have been because you know, that glute on that one side wasn't strong enough. So you had to use your bicep, right? So yeah. you almost want to keep working down to the lowest, you know, point in your body, right? And so we came up with this software to really leverage what's called a force plate and how you interact with the ground. And that looks at the pattern of how you create movement, what we call a signature. And that movement signature then gives insights on where you need to focus left versus right you know, anterior versus posterior. Um, and that flow of energy can start creating a whole host of, I guess, priorities of what individuals need. Fascinating. Oh, that is so fascinating. Um, yeah, your soundbite about where it hurts, it ain't. <laughs> it's so yeah. funny. It's so true. And, but it's like, honestly, it must be maddening to be in your line of work because people are, I there's probably no other branch of health and wellness and for that matter, medicine where people self-diagnose more than with injury, like, oh, yeah. the tennis elbow is acting up again. Like, I don't, <laughs> what is that even? How, how do I even get that? Yeah. Dr. <laughs> Google is, uh, yeah. is a tough, is a tough <laughs> adversary. I think for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. So really wild. So your technology maps the interaction with the ground is like a foot strike thing. Yeah. So actually it can, it can be either a jump on that plate, or it can be just a simple balance test, you know, kind of like you were looking at with your glute issues, like, okay, when you balance, how is this shifting and and movement occurring? Wow. Oh my gosh. I geek out on this so much. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Can you give us an anecdote of an example? So you you did give us the anecdote of the baseball player. You can, you can maybe predict what you say, elbow injury, baseline foot strike. So give us a cool anecdote. Another one. Yeah. So I, I think the other thing is you know, at least on a group level for coaches or, 
you know, we were working with a, a team, you know, uh, a college team, and we started to see all these forces as a group shoot up and improve, you know, after months. And it was just this random spike. So we called them up and we asked, you know, hey, what are you doing? Like, everybody's gotten so much better. And they said, well, it's easy. We used to train four days a week. Now we train three days. And I said, that's it? They said, yeah, that's it. So almost back to the, you know, earlier discussion of like, we probably need a lot more, a lot less than we think, right? Mm -hmm. So there's both the micro level of what exercise do, but then the macro level, like what's the training frequency? What's the volume you're doing? And trying to find that sweet spot, right? Yeah. Much We say a lot of what we're trying to do is a lot like pharmacology. Right. I was just thinking, yeah. yeah what's the dose, right? What's yeah. the right yeah. dose? Yeah. What's the frequency? And also, I think a lot of what's interesting for fitness coaches is when is there a tolerance? Mm -hmm. Like when do you actually, mm -hmm. when do you actually seek a, a diminishing returns of a certain exercise or program and therefore you need to shift, oh. right? Right now we do it every four weeks. Why? Because that's when the month changes, right? So mm -hmm. why not? I was thinking, like you said, pharmacology. I was thinking um, psychedelics. <laughs> yeah. Hear me out, but like, yeah. in, in the sense of integration, right? So the the well, medicine does what it does, but then there has to be an integration plan, and that's the piece that's missing. It's kind of like we, okay, I did the thing at the gym. I, you know, I do this every day. It's just this kind of box that I check with no bigger picture, like zooming out, like how does this actually integrate in my full wellness mm -hmm. plan? Right. Like, where rest becomes, well, rest we know is where we get stronger. Like we, everybody kind of knows that on some level, but nobody rests. It's just Because <laughs> you can't usually measure it, right? That's yeah. usually the hard part. If you can show, <laughs> hey, like in that, in that case of the team I mentioned, if you can, if you can show, hey, with rest, you got better, right? That, might start to curb that itch, right? To do yeah. more. Then you mentioned tolerance. And I, I don't know, I'll make sure I interpreted this right. Because as soon as you said that, I felt triggered because I felt like during the height of my exercise addiction, which for sure I was, it had to suck more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like if it didn't suck, like it, I just got to the point where, and it even still plagues me to this day. If I go and do an intense workout, I have to go in there saying, I'm very tolerant to sucky exercise. I can push myself beyond my limit without even noticing it because I've built up this tolerance over the years of just being dumb in the gym. Is that what you meant? Yeah, I, I think I meant more, oh. you know, just like when you take medications, right? There's certain medications that after a while you have to change the dosage or switch the medication mm -hmm. because you're no longer responding to it. Got you. Right? So it's, you know, I think exercise is medicine. Right. And so at what point do you need to change that medicine if it's not having the desired effect? Right. Yeah. So, you know, I, I was about to sort of chime in when we talk about, well, we kind of all know that really we get stronger in the recovery period and the rest. But I, th I think trainers probably know that. But I don't the, the number of just end clients don't know that. Right. They don't the number of the number of clients that used to come into my old gym that would be like, I don't get it. I'm plateauing. I'm not getting stronger. It's really frustrating. And I'm like, well, go, you need to go home and take three days off. <laughs> you have been here every day. You know, that the, and this is what I was trying to drive home, that the, the benefit of exercise comes in how the body responds afterwards. And if you're not giving the body enough time afterwards, that is, I guess, adequate for the dose you just gave it. Right. Yeah, totally. So the harder you go, the longer the rest you need. That's the way that works, you know? And it, he at first was really reluctant until he's like, all right, fine, I'm going to try it. And then he did. He came back. He took three full days off. He didn't come in on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, came back Monday, and he crushed it. And he felt amazing. So we restructured his plan, and he would still come in because he liked the community. But there were days he wasn't doing the normal workout. He was doing something else. He was just sort of like a low, easy ride on the bike, or he was mobility or whatever. Um, so I think the end consumer really doesn't get it. And, and if this tool and if this technology can help people understand that, boy, what a phenomenal outcome. So I would love for you to walk us through kind of how you, you like, what is the tool? What's the technology and how might coaches. So again, is this something that a coach would utilize for clients or is it something a coach would refer a client to that they either purchase themselves or go to a facility or how does that work? Yeah, no, we, we have coaches use it. 
um, use it. And, and it's a, it's really a way to, you know, it's got, you know, two kind of, you know, benefits was as coaches use it when they, when they're able to assess clients and the assessment takes about two minutes total, you know, so that was key. We wanted to make it as short as weighing in. Yeah. Just you get your weight. And that's a big thing we want to change is we want to shift the metric from body weight, you know, to function and movement Mm -hmm. because there's plenty of overweight people that live long lives and there's plenty of skinny people that die early. Mm -hmm. We got to shift form to function. Um, And so that quick assessment, you know, allows, you know, the coach to work with a client of here's where you're at. We're doing this because of what we see from the assessment. And hopefully the helpful part is like, then if the client does something, they're able to quickly see how they changed. And that helps with compliance, right? Because that's what we're all as coaches fighting, right? Is compliance. How do, how do we improve compliance, um, you know, for that long-term duration? Yeah. So how does it work? So uh, you've got a coach that's working with a client. Mm -hmm. Um, What's step one? How does this, how does the technology work? So client will step onto this force plate and do a jump and or a balance, you know, that takes, you know, a couple minutes total, you know, from that assessment immediately, you know, they're shown their results, you know, we, we provide them kind of percentiles based on age and sex at birth and say, okay, you know, 50 is average. Here's where you're at, you know, based on, you know, your scores, you know, these are some of the exercises that are best for you. And we call it a movement panel, like a blood panel. So it's all these metrics, right? Like instead of sodium, potassium, cholesterol, it's, you know, you know, sway velocity, which is how much you move on your balance or rate of force development, how quickly you can develop, you know, force or tension. So all these pieces in a movement panel, just like a blood panel, allow the coach to pick and choose what the priority of the next exercise session or Hmm. plan is. That's awesome. So is, do you have guidance on whether a coach should be, a, is it, so whether a coach decides to use a jump or a balance, is that determined by what the goal of the client is? Do they run both? Yeah, does- it's, 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 it's generally, yeah, determined by the coach and the level of the person. So mm-hmm. we like to say internally, we work from SEALs to seniors, you know, mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, a lot of seniors aren't doing jumps, mm-hmm. you know, um, so it might just be a balance for them. But folks that are younger and more active might do a jump and a balance. Oh my gosh. I'm thinking about it about for my senior dad. So he's yes, he cannot balance. He's falling down all the time. Yeah. Every like, do you have any? I keep asking for cool anecdotes, but do you have a cool anecdote about how a senior uh, got better by assessing maybe their balance? Yeah. So um, even for the most low functioning individuals, we we just do a two foot standing. And we're able to see that sway. And I think what we've seen the most anecdotally is it helps drive seniors more to what, what at least in the research, what's been most effective is community classes, oh, nice. right? And so oh, cool. which community class should they do? Because if an individual is overly mobile, like they're swaying a lot when they balance, doing yoga moves that improve mobility may not be as helpful as a resistance training community class, right? Mm-hmm. Or as someone who is like very stiff, like a two by four, right? A resistance training class may not be the first priority instead oh of more mobility work, right? So it's helping at the senior level, direct them to a community class, you know, it, as you know, one area we've seen some, some value. That's really interesting. Just that anecdote was really cool because like using this sort of sway velocity, the, the wobbliness, yeah. <laughs> I guess, gauge, um, you know, you might automatically assume, oh, that's a balance issue. You should go and do some tree pose in a yoga class to fix that. But, but it might be that there's just not enough strength versus people. Correct. So you can actually see, you can actually pay attention to which intervention is, it's not always the same thing. It's not wobbliness is not always a lack of balance. It could be high uh, extra mobility or restricted mobility literally this tool tells you that which is just th- again like there's too much guesswork there's too much self diagnoses and the stuff there are, there are uh, you know nature a big medical journal published an article there are over 130 causes of back pain oh my god over 130 right so like it's like oh just get your core stronger 
It's like, well, maybe, maybe yeah. not, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's my question. So if, let's say you've got a, a health coach who um, has recognized he or she wants to bring, you know, movement is a part of what they coach around, but they're not really fitness people. The, how much existing or background knowledge does a coach need to have to use this tool effectively? Or do you provide training? Like just how, I guess, diagnostic or prescriptive is the output of the testing or the assessment? Yeah, it's it's very layered. You know, at a high level, we've got, you know, end users using it without any physiology, exercise, science background, you know, so mm-hmm. it can, it can function, you know, for at a high level of like, okay, do this, right? Got it. I'll do that. And then at the, you know, but it's got enough layers where, you know, folks even use it in a research setting to get really in the weeds and gather some finite variables and study them against other things. So there's different layers depending on the type of user and the desire, you know, like we have athletes using it as consumers, you know, and they're like, I don't care what it means. Just tell me what to do, you know? Mm -hmm. And, And then on the other end, you know, these, these academic labs, you know, want to know like how to measure multi-scale, multivariate entropy, which m- most of us, myself included, can't even spell, right? <laughs> so these are variables they want to look at that are more machine learning driven. So there's all these kind of variables in, or layers in between for different folks to interact with it. Very cool. Oh. And so when you're describing how um, it's used, so the, the client gets on just as a quick check, whether it's a jumper or, or a balance, it spits out... Um, I'm hoping I got this right, but it spits out kind of like, here's where some maybe imbalances are and here's the exercises that are recommended to handle that. And then did you say that you might go, they might go back and check after having done the exercises? Yeah. Right. Because I think what you want to see is like how those exercises are changing, um, mm-hmm. you know, in the same way that, you know, a lot of times some of the value of nutritional interventions is getting blood tests to see, okay, did these values actually change? Right. And, and where do they change and how much? Because, you know, I think a lot of times we assume that certain medicines, certain foods, certain exercises are going to have an impact, but they're not going to have the same impact for every person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so there's a plate that people stand on, balance on, jump on, what have you, that um, there, an assessment is done. And I, I'm assuming there's some sort of, is it a software? Is it an app? Is it, yeah. what is it? Yeah. So there's a, there is an app. Um, but, and there's also a software kind of platform that has the reporting, you know, one of the things we've done is, is from that report, it might say, Hey, you're, you're, you're weak anteriorly, meaning you might, um, you might not be able to generate, generate force in an anterior direction forward very well. Right. Um, we try to stay away from saying it's a certain muscle. Okay. Because we really actually may not know. Yeah. Um, and so instead, what we've been able to link is certain movements that do improve those variables. Um, a lot of times anterior, it is quads. And a mm-hmm. lot of times, but we, what we do know is that it is squatting. Um, but I think we all know squatting isn't just quads. It just happens to be a big part of that, right? Mm-hmm. So that we try to link it to an actual movement than a muscle, but it is it does get to that level with saying, okay, you just did your jump. It shows you're weak anteriorly. And so these are some of the exercises like a squat we would recommend. That's awesome. And then if you're hurt or maybe you're um, functioning at a lower level, maybe you're older, it may just be like a wall sit, right? Yeah. Where you're working on those same kind of areas, but in a lesser intensity. How would you uh, combine this with, so, so, so somebody does have an injury or some kind of, they, they can't move because the pain is too intense or whatever the case may be. Like, can you, does it help with injury, pinpointing injury? Does it assist yeah. with that kind of as well? Yeah. And I think mostly trying to identify what's causing that pain, what's causing that injury, right? Because, you know, both of you guys talk about your experiences, right? Where it hurts an eight, right? And so how do we, through the rehab and injury process, also identify what may be the underlying cause. Yeah. Okay. I have a question for you. It's very specific. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but again, it's, okay. And I'm going back to this example where I went in with this butt pain that wasn't <laughs> sciatica, even though everybody thinks their butt pain is sciatica, but the sciatic nerve could be caught up anyway, anyway, whatever. Right. So for two years, I couldn't, I could not a weight bear. I couldn't weight bear 
I couldn't use that glute for two years. Like I had a lot of atrophy, a lot of strength loss. I couldn't squat. I couldn't, I certainly couldn't split squat. I couldn't do a lunge on that leg for sure. Sometimes I have to do a lunge because I teach group fitness and I have to do it. And I would just wince and just like cry through it. It was so painful, so painful. I can't even describe the pain of weight bearing on that leg. Then I went for this movement assessment. He reconnected my brain to my glute, whatever. Okay. So (laughs) we all talked about that already. By the end of that session, 20 minutes later, I was lunging with no pain. And I said, but wait, I'm injured. (laughs) And he said, no, you're not. (laughs) I said, yeah, but it hurts. It even hurts when I'm sleeping at night. It throbs. He's like, yeah, I don't think there's an injury there. Your brain kind of invented that pain to protect some, this, whatever, this imbalance in your, in your musculoskeletal system or whatever. Is that is that crazy? Did I? <laughs> no, no, I think it, I think it's a good question because we're expanding on what Laura asked earlier of what the musculoskeletal system is, okay. you know, a better word, right. Is neuromuscular. neuromuscular mm-hmm. Yeah. Because your muscles and bones didn't change in that 20 minutes. Oh. Right. But your nerves and your connected nervous system, which drives, right. Drives that musculoskeletal system that can change rapidly. Yeah. Right? We like to say like, if the hardware is the muscles and the bones, the software is that neuro system, right? Yeah. The, that's driving that. And just like a software update, that can happen quickly. It's right? wild. Yeah, that's, I think that's the value of, of movement, looking at movement rather than, you yeah. know, necessarily, fo- you know, structures. Yeah. So his, his, philo- his thinking was, if I interpreted him correctly, was that something to the effect of like, there really aren't pain receptors there that per se that, or there's just, there's not in, injured tissue there, but because I had been convincing myself that I was <laughs> injured, it was giving a pain reaction because it knew that I like, it just feels completely kooky to imagine that that thing <laughs> was not an injury. It was an invented injury by my brain to protect that part of my body. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, the pain is, is, is probably one of the more complex yeah. things in the human experience, right? Because it's not just physical, right? There's a lot of, uh, and, the, and you know, if we, we all know what I think a placebo is, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you believe something and, and it's true and it's super powerful in, in medicine and, and in health, right? And so if you believe something, it truly can override, you know, how you experience and the intensity with which you experience it in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, just thinking in terms of everyday health coaches who work with everyday, you know, Johns and Janes that are walking around with like stiff neck pain, shoulder issues, and a lot of this coming from more of a sedentary lifestyle. So I could see like, how, how is standing on a plate is, can it address these kind of concerns of just the everyday person who's not an athlete, who's not an active exerciser, but just is in pain many cases due to inactivity or a lot of it's probably posture, you know, how they hold themselves, how much time they spend sitting, that kind of stuff. Is it applicable under those circumstances or is this mostly for active people? No, it's definitely applicable there. I think, you know, the, the term in research and medicine for balance testing is posturography. So it's, is really the study of your posture, right? That's, that's what balance is looking at. And, Folks may have neck pain because, you know, there's a shoulder imbalance or a lack of scapular stability, Mm -hmm. right? Or it could be a, you know, excessive lumbar, right? Lower back mobility, right? Mm -hmm. Or it even could be caused from your hips. But there's a lot of research that supports that, you know, neck pain is linked to how you stand and how your posture is in that standing position, right? And it really just strengthens this whole concept we're talking about is, the body's a system, yeah. not this isolated parts right throughout, right? And if we look at it as isolated parts, we're gonna we're all going to be chasing our tails to fix the pain, but it, we're never going to find that solution, at least not mm-hmm. for a long lasting period. Do you wow. think a personal trainer could become qualified to assess at this level? Yeah. You know, I think a lot of, a lot of, you know, I think a coach or a trainer's education comes through experience, right? Mm-hmm. And over time using technology, what 
we hope and have seen happen is it starts being like we like to say we want it to be a sherpa yeah right for these for these coaches and trainers they can start using their experiences combined with data and it's going to accelerate their education right yeah. sure because sometimes the data is going to totally reinforce what they think instinctually right yeah. sometimes it's going to challenge it and allow them to learn something new so they can they're kind of learning with the technology and our hope is the technology is learning with people too, mm. right? It's this symbiotic, you know, relationship that is really meant to augment, you know, all these coaches, trainers that are using it. Yeah. So if just based on how you described how this works, this is likely be a tool that coaches who see people in person use, right? You've got to have some sort of physical um, interaction with this plate that you're using. So folks that have... A 100% online practice, unless they unless they've got the ability to send a client to a local person who might be using it for an assessment tool. Um, but for folks that see people face to face, work in a gym, uh, a lot of health coaches working in functional medicine um, practices, chiropractors' offices, um, just normal MD practices. That, so, so coaches that see people in person. For now, yeah. For now, I mean, in five years, we should replace the weight scale in every home. Yes. That would be super cool. Or yeah. um yeah. actually, Phil, do you have an iPhone? Are you an iPhone user or an Android yes. user? Yes. Okay. IPhone, yeah. Okay. Have you guys seen in the health app? Have you paid attention to your health app lately? Did you know there's a fall warning notification yes. in there yeah. where it, it's using the accelerometer on your phone? I'm assuming to to judge your wobbliness as you're walking. Yeah, we're bringing in that data into the software right now and, oh, and cool. integrating. Yeah, because there's it's a great way to, you know, start gathering uh, what we call exposures, right? Like, and walking's an exposure of stimulus, right? Like, how are you walking? How is that stability working, right? Because then you start pairing up all these cause and effects, like 10,000 steps, right? People mm -hmm. know that? Not one scientific paper supports it. <laughs> and it's just because the Japanese came up with the first pedometer in the 1950s and the translation to English is 10,000 steps. Oh yeah, pedometer <laughs> it is, you're right. You no, know, so it has nothing to do with like that as a threshold. Um and so I think you know through areas like the Apple Watch or or Apple phone like how can we really start identifying what those thresholds are? Mm -hmm. You know, cuz sometimes we do danger in that if someone does 10,000 steps, they get worse, they have more pain, they're like, "Well, screw that walking thing. I'm not doing that." <laughs> you know, like yeah. yeah. 10,000 steps with um, some kind of biomechanical imbalance is 10,000 reps up, 10,000 exactly. bad reps. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Oh my God. So it might be 4,500. We don't know. Yep. Wow. That's Very so cool. funny. What a funny like backstory about how we, I mean, I, I always thought it was a pretty arbitrary number, but really the spirit behind it was just get out and move more. If, yes. if, if you need a target and if you need a goal, 10,000 oh. is as good as you know, anything else. What we don't want is people beating themselves up because they hit 9,500. And oh my God, I Sometimes, I mean, that's the dark side of tech, right? Is that, you know, there can be an obsession over, oh man, I got seven hours of sleep. I'm supposed to get eight, right? And then you can't sleep because you're like, I got to force myself to get eight hours. You know, so, <laughs> you know it, that can be the challenge with, with technology is that's why it'll never replace practitioners. Exactly. Yeah. Never. That's something right. we should speak to. Yeah. We yeah. always talk about that. It's like um, the quantified self is fine to a point, but then it's like, there's, there has to be action attached to that data. Somehow you have to be able to take that data and make it actionable or, or per pertinent to your life. Um, you know, your, your example of the sleep tracker is a good example. I thank goodness I lost my aura ring at the gym because I always lose my aura ring at the gym because you can't lift weights with an aura ring on. But anyway, it, my life has gotten better because I was not stressing about, oh, my readiness is so low today. I guess I should take it easy. I turn into my ring. Like, I think data is only good to a point. And I think that's what you're getting at. And then we have to bring in practitioners to make that actionable. Yeah, because yeah, and we can't look at the data as law, right? right. It's, it's not, it, you know, data, much like the human body, it's always evolving. And there's no right or wrong. It's it, there's only better, you know. And so, you know, over time, the data is going to get more insightful from wearables and technology, you know. But we just can't hold that to such a 
high stringent standard, you know, right. like the 10,000 steps, you know, or the eight hours of sleep. Well, the, this has been the problem, I think, of the um, sort of evidence-based medicine crowd, which look, we all need evidence, but there's different types of evidence. And just because something wasn't a double blind placebo controlled trial doesn't mean that practitioner evidence of actual doctors or practitioners or chiropractors or trainers are saying, no, this is what I'm seeing in real time with actual humans. There's got to be something here because if the data is not supporting it, then there's a conflict between what's happening in real life and data. Something there's a, a disconnect. And, and when we were first kind of connected for this podcast, that was something you felt very strongly about. I think if we if we continue to wait for complete and utter validation, it's never gonna it's never gonna happen, mm -hmm. right? And so that's where the blend of data and technology with instinct, you know, and awareness. Hopefully, what data and technology does is it creates awareness, right? Yes. That's that's right. the value. It shouldn't create hard rules for our lives, right? right? It creates awareness and guiding. That's why I use that analogy of being a Sherpa, right? The technology mm -hmm. should be a Sherpa. You, you still got to climb the mountain. It's just making you aware of where to step or not, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And so I think sometimes, yeah, the, the medical world approaches things too rigidly as, as does the consumer. Like, you know, oh, I asked my doctor, he, he told me this, so that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh my gosh. This is so interesting. I honestly could ask you a million more questions about dumb biomechanical <laughs> imbalances, but we won't. Because I think this has been really uh, just a really compelling conversation around where movement practice, fitness, which is a, a big part of you know our audience is probably half fitness, mm -hmm. yeah, fitness uh, junkies, fat fitness trainers, and um, I love any time because I've been in the fitness industry since the '90s, and it it's it's so 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 due for a renaissance, and it's just like the slowest barge ever to like change. So things like this are pretty exciting. And I do hope our listeners get excited about collecting this kind of data, empowering their clients to understand how their body moves and works, how it yeah, connects yeah. with their brain. I think it's a really, it's a really fun, really fun stuff. Yeah. I think anything that allows the end user to move with intention and purpose mm -hmm. um, is a good thing. I mean, because Aaron and I both see people at the gym all the time that are on the stinking treadmill every single day for God knows how long with a goal in mind that they clearly haven't met because they're still running and they look exactly the same, right? right? So what, what's the intention? And if a tool like this can help you determine what's going to be, I guess, the minimum effective dose with the right movements that'll get me where I want to go in a shorter period of time, I don't care how much it costs. It's worth it rather than considering, you know, just wasting time. Because that's the most valuable resource, right? That's hard to put a price right. on in time, right? Exactly. That's what yeah. all of us need more of, right? More, more so, time. Exactly. So, how do people find out more about the technology and how to get access to it? Where can they? Where can they? Yeah, look? we've got we've got a website, SpartaScience dot com, um, and so yeah, then you know that's where we've got kind of a lot of the case studies we kind of chatted about or, or anecdotes, but then also kind of for those looking for a deeper dive, kind of the education and it's got a blog, to, a lot of times talking about movement and how it relates to people and organizations. Amazing. I love it. Great. Awesome. Thank you so much. This thank was so guys. much fun. We could yeah. keep, yeah, I know, but we're trying to be respectful. So thank you again. This was great. This was, yeah, fantastic. Thanks for having me on. This podcast was brought to you by Primal Health Coach Institute. To learn more about how to become a successful health coach, get in touch with us by visiting primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or if you're already a successful health coach, practitioner, influencer, or thought leader with a thriving business and an interesting story, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us at hello at primalhealthcoach.com and let us know why we need to interview you for Health Coach Radio. Thanks for listening.